Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, so let's get started. Thanks for coming. Um, Emery is a PhD student from the Computer Science Department at the Stanford University. He received a master's degree in, uh, from Stanford in 2002 and a bachelor's degree uh, from uh, UC Berkeley. His uh, research interest is broadly in the area of uh, system dependability and the application of machine learning techniques to improve system manageability. Uh, he was a summer intern here in my group in uh, 2003. He did a very good paper on how do we do self-management of Windows Registry? Emery. Thank you. I'm going to talk to you today about using statistical monitoring to detect failures in Internet services. So let me start by talking about the broader problem. What's at issue here? The, the real issue is that Internet services fail. That's the problem that I'm, I'm trying to address. And what happens is that this actually is a serious problem. So recent surveys indicate that um, more than 60% of otherwise well-managed internet services have user-visible failures at, on them. The lost revenue from these types of failures can be severe. In the worst case, anywhere from hundred, hundreds of thousands of dollars to millions of dollars for every hour that the site is down. In addition to this financial problem, there's a human pain as well. To fix these problems, you often have to um, you often have to call up uh, dozens of engineers who are responsible for different parts of the site and get them to try and figure out what's wrong. Ben? Two questions. The first line says user visible failures, the second line is per hour. What percentage, what percentage actually have enough that you know, they end up, I mean, presumably then the, the actual metric is how mm -hmm. much they lose. The user visible failures listed here in that survey were more of the broader, um, just minor issues. You know, you couldn't get to some additional help page or you found a product that you weren't able to buy, you clicked again and you were able to buy it. So it's not true that sites actually lost 100k a year? Um, no. The, 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 numbers, are, the, the numbers, are, those numbers are from different surveys. The number of hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars per hour is for catastrophic failures where the site really just melts down. Mm -hmm. um, that would be Amazon, that would be financial service companies where a lot of money changes hands through them, things like that. Now, what I'm going to focus on in this talk is um, some a class of failures that's actually harder to detect. So these are application level failures where, on, uh, where the symptoms of the failure don't show up in a way that the administrator of a site can easily see. So for example, if it's a machine crash, the administrator can see that. But there's lots of other problems that only the customers of the site, the end users, are able to, to see. And actually detecting these failures talking to internet service providers accounts for three quarters of the time to uh, total time to recover. So the, the fixing the problem real, and realizing, realizing where the problem is and fixing it is actually just 25% of your total time to recover from a given failure. The approach I'm going to talk about looks at the structure of a site and how a site is behaving internally to develop a model of what the normal behavior is in this site. And then using statistical monitoring to detect anomalies and that. So I'm going to talk about some results from, ex from uh, my testbed experiments, as well as early results from Amazon.com and a second large internet service. So let me go into the type of failures that people have a hard time detecting today. Now, this is a problem <coughs> that I ran into myself when my wife sent me um, an itinerary for a flight that she'd purchased. So here we see a US Airways site, and it's supposed to be showing the itinerary for her flight. But what we actually see is that there's no itinerary on this page, even though this is the right page. There's no other link to follow to get to the itinerary. This is where it's supposed to be occurring. The only detail about her ticket is that it was confirmed on Friday, October 10th. However, the ticket was bought in March for travel in April. That's just the wrong detail. So there's obviously something going wrong here. The issue is that from just like uh, stepping back a minute, it looks like the side is up. It's uh, if you, if, you, if you have this machine sending out heartbeats, it's still alive. Nothing has crashed. Um, if you look at the HTTP protocol level, there's no HTTP errors. There's no problem with the HTML. It validates perfectly fine. And the site is even performing well. Everything looks OK. So the problem here 
is that failures aren't always easy to detect, and they're not always easily defined in systems terms. They're not things like the machine has crashed or the machine is performing poorly. A failure occurs if a user notices a problem. And really, the challenge detecting this broader class of problems is that in these large systems, there's no specification for what the application is supposed to be doing. The semantics of what functionality is being provided are at a human level and very hard to write down at, um, in a way that machines can automatically check for. If you try to take the opposite approach and say, I'm going to specify all the things that can go wrong, well, it's really difficult in addition to anticipate all those error conditions. And even if you could just once write all this information down, either all the error conditions or all the things that it's supposed to do to get right, requiring you to keep this specification maintained as you change your site over time would be just a nightmare. So my approach makes the assumption that we have to accept that we don't fully understand how this system works. And we're going to look to detect these types of problems without having an a priori specification of what the system is actually supposed to be doing. Stepping back a second, how, how, how do people approach this problem today? How do people detect these failures? Talking to internet services, I found three classes of fault monitors deployed today. One of these simple low-level monitors, the things that look for heartbeats, pings, is the process still alive? These are great, they're very easy to deploy, but they don't detect high-level problems. The second class of monitor that people use are application-specific tests, where people have encoded for some important piece of functionality. They've said, this is what the application is supposed to do. I'm going to write client code that will explicitly test this functionality and make sure that it looks right when the answer comes back. This trades off code complexity and maintainability for the ability to detect these problems. Um, there is a code coverage issue, but really the problem is that here you have to do a lot more work to keep these tests maintained and up to date as you change your system. Otherwise you're going to get false alarms and false positives and false negatives um, as, as your system evolves. The third type of monitor that people use today is to look at their business metrics. If you have an e-commerce site, for example, you often have the ability to look at how much money is coming, out of, coming in through your site and have some idea of what, to, what type of money you expect to be coming over the site. There's a discrepancy there where, for example, all of a sudden your orders drop significantly, then you're going you're, you're to have some idea that there's something wrong with your website. The problem is that detecting, it through biz detecting these failures through business metrics can be too late. They're already affecting your business. Yeah. The problem is that with those is that there's a lot of noise, and it takes quite quite a number of hours for those reports to filter back. And it works even uh, it's even worse when when people start to outsource their customer service organizations. Then you're not only going through your own customer service department, but you're going through a completely different company that doesn't necessarily understand how your system is working. But, but might that frequency of those things simply, you know, because you forget reading them, the fact that they they're twice the normal and for the last hour or the normal prior to that, mm -hmm. everybody is just in the service. Yeah. Yeah, but it does take time for this to filter back. That's that's the issue. I mean, hours, days. Why is um, It just, it just does. I can't speak to why these people don't do, you know, some of these things smart. But. Okay, great. Yes. Well administered stuff that it wasn't like trying to do post coverage Yeah, and that was enough. Fairly Interesting. Yeah, a lot of the sites I've talked with have just basically thrown up their hand and said we don't understand the system. It's too large at this point for us to have a knowledge of even, you know, we know say our top ten key components. But we have hundreds of components, 
and and which ones of those of those minor ones end up affecting things as an issue? Hmm? Um, Amazon.com is one site that I can name. Um, some of the other people in my group have talked with eBay as well. Um, we've done work with Tell Me, which is a, a medium-sized, I guess, organization, and some smaller ones such as Ebates, um, or rebate like coupon site, and a couple others that I can't name. Okay. Now stepping back a little bit, there's a broader problem at stake here as well, and that's we're not we don't understand the large-scale systems that we're building. This makes manageability harder and dependability worse for these large systems. And really, the issue is that we can only see the low-level behaviors of the, of the systems that we're building. We can't ask the high-level, big-picture questions that we actually care about. Is the whole system working? What's going to happen if the environment changes? Um, so the goal of my research is to bridge this gap between the low-level details that we can observe and the big-picture questions that we actually care about. Focus, I'm, my research to date is focused mostly on the fault management problem, process and what I'm going to be talking about in this talk is the issue of um, the issue of, of asking the big picture question is the system working and doing that by looking at these low level details so my goal in a nutshell is to improve availability by detecting more failures automatically and this better detection should give us a faster return to service and the focus is going to be on failures that are hard to detect today mm -hmm. This is more of the operations based. What I'm interested in is monitoring systems um, without necessarily changing their code. And I'll get into the details of the approach in a, in a, within a couple slides. Mm -hmm. um, and so basically, I, want, I hope I've convinced you that this is a relevant problem because poor detection hurts service availability and costs, can cost significant amounts of money. It's a challenging problem just because it's fundamentally difficult to detect a problem, without, uh, detect a failure without knowing what the system is supposed to be doing in the first place. It's an unsolved problem because the existing monitors aren't adequate to the task, and it's an important problem because it's one aspect of a broader problem in managing complex systems. Take back a little bit to the very first question. Do you have any, no, okay. uh, any, any idea, total idea of what fraction of these sort of user failure problems are the big picture problems that you detect with these detailed ones that everything looks okay, but the user is. Um, so talking to these internet services, they say that, that uh, they do have a problem with fault detection. Um, and it often ends up relying on, say, noticing that orders are dropping and not noticing earlier symptoms of the problem that could help them fix it before it gets to uh, something that significantly impacts customers. So that relies just going back to that 75% number, that 75% of the time to recover is detection. So my work has gone across a couple different stages of the fault management process, from inferring system structure at the beginning, going into fault detection, fault localization, and finally using some of this information to trigger automatic recovery from failures. And I've done this work in the context of different types of systems, the Windows registry, cost of hash tables on one end, J2EE, which is a middleware framework for, for building internet services, and going into then um, larger internet services like Amazon.com and a second anonymous site. My talk today is focused on this part of my work, the fault detection um, in the context of J2EE and Amazon.com and this other site. So most of, my, most of the work I'm going to talk about is going to be focused in on how I solve this problem in the J2EE environment. Then I'll go on and present some early results from Amazon.com and this other site. So I've talked to you about what internet service failures are, why I think they're a problem worth addressing. In the next section of the talk, I'm going to talk, uh, talk about the different structural behaviors that I'm analyzing to detect these failures, um, uh, to, to better detect these problems. Then I'm going to talk about how I model and monitor those behaviors to actually um, notice anomalies. And finally, evaluation, and then I'll wrap up the talk. So here's a picture of a typical three-tier internet service. And the important bits to get here 
um, are that it's a relatively well-structured um, system. In the first tier, you have a stateless presentation tier. These are the web servers that are open and receiving requests from the internet. In the middle tier, you have the bulk of your business logic and um, application code. And this code is built on top of uh, some sort of uh, standard middleware that runs across the site. This whole system then is distributed across lots of machines, even in this middleware. The databases then at the end in the third tier tend to manage persistent state and keep, make sure that, that the data that's important um, doesn't get corrupted. So when a request comes into a site, it hits this first web server tier. The web server then forwards it on to an appropriate component in the middleware. These components then talk amongst each other, talk to the database, and then um, do some work and then send a response back along this path propagated through the web server back to the user. Now, what I'm going to do now is go through an example request. One request that I saw in a um, one of the, the applications that I've deployed in my test bed. So let's go through and say this is a checkout request where someone has gone through an e-commerce site and is ready to now um, check out um, and uh, buy the items in their shopping cart. So the first thing that happens is this web server component says this is related to shopping. I'm going to send this request on to the shopping client controller. The shopping client controller then says the first thing that has to be done to satisfy this request is to take a look at what's inside the cart. So then it goes over to this cart component, and the cart component says, OK, I'll talk to the catalog component and return the details of the items that are in, in this cart. Then the shopping client controller gets control again and says the next step, now that I know what items this user wants to buy, is to make sure that these items are available in the inventory, and then goes off and talks to the inventory component to do that. And finally, now that, now that the shopping client controller knows that these items are available, it goes to the customer component and says, Here's the items that you want to buy. Send this billing and ship. Send it along with the customer's billing and shipping information to the order component. The order component writes this information out to the database, and this is done. The key idea here is that the component granularity at which these components are defined and the behavior that they are showing in their interactions with the, with each other is tied to application functionality. This is not true in all systems. Not all libraries, for example, have their functions. Uh, defined on the basis of what functionality they're providing. It's often more um, a matter of code readability and other issues. But in internet services, because of scalability concerns and software engineering concerns, um, they tend to be written in this way, and we're going to take advantage of that. And what we're going to do explicitly is actually say that we can see a reflection of application functionality in these behaviors that we can observe. And if we notice a change in these behaviors, we're going to know that application functionality is changing as well. And that might be a failure. So, I'm just trying to understand a little bit what you mean by this behavior. I mean, it seems to me that what you've illustrated is a data model. And uh, there's a workflow that relates how things are used in parts, catalogs to cart. Uh, is, is it really more that, that for web services, you have a well-defined data model, and that the uh, the actions that you take are essentially small transactions on these data models? Um, I mean, I'm trying to understand what this sentence really means. Yeah. I mean, granularity and behavior. More semantically. Yeah. What, what I'm trying to say is, yes, there is a semantic workflow underneath the covers here. And moreover, we can easily observe that semantic workflow by simply looking at the interactions between components. And those interactions would be at, at, at the level of what network requests or receipt controls? Or? Mm -hmm. That depends on the type of middleware you're using. Right. Um, in the systems that I've been looking at, it, it's both RPC requests across machines, mm -hmm. as well as function calls that cross component boundaries within a single virtual machine process. But, but, so the idea is that, that if I think about like an object model, Mm -hmm. The components are, are, are tied somehow to these object models in a natural way that corresponds to actual events the user is doing. Yes. Right? That, that the workflow somehow is there's a tight coupling between what the user is doing and what's happening. So yeah, that is correct. So, Looking, trying to understand this behavior and, and look at what patterns we can actually analyze to, to detect problems when they occur. 
I've, I've identified two behaviors that I look at in my experiments. The first is component interactions. And that is for one component in the system, across all the requests that are flowing through the system, how is this component interacting with the rest of the components in the system? So that's here right now just um, represented by these links that are both between one particular component or paying attention to all the other components. The second behavior is a complementary behavior. This is, instead of looking at one component and all the requests going through it, we're going to look at one request and all the components that this flows through. So this is a component level call tree that follows a request through the multiple tiers and nodes of the system. And in a sense, also, these two behaviors correspond to two different units of failure that we care about. One is the system's view of a unit of failure, and that's the component. The component is something the system cares about. This request view of how this request's path flows through the system is tied to the user's unit of failure. They care about, what did my request succeed or fail? So this is really giving us coverage in two orthogonal ways uh, that are both useful for different reasons. Now I'm going to talk about some of the problems with actually modeling these behaviors, how we model them to help us detect anomalies, and how we then um, actually uh, uh, detect problems by finding these anomalies. So what we wanted to, to do to detect changes in possible problems is to learn a model of the acceptable patterns of behavior that we believe are probably correct. And so the challenge first is how to build this model in the first place. The second challenge then is as we're using this, how do we deal with false alarms? How do we avoid some of them? And then how do we mitigate the ones that are left? And this is a good place to, for me to point out that I am a systems researcher. And I do not have a statistical or machine learning background. So I'm certainly not an expert in there. My goal in doing this work is not to say this is the algorithm to use to detect anomalies in these behaviors. But just to say that, look, even the simplest algorithms for detecting anomalies give us a huge benefit over the other, the other more ad hoc ways that systems research is that uh, systems operators and administrators are detecting problems in these systems today. So the first challenge, how do we capture probably correct behavior of some, some pattern within the system? So what we want to do is yeah, build the baseline that summarizes what's acceptable um, in terms of uh, this behavior that we've seen. It doesn't have to be perfect. It can be, for example, um, too big. It can uh, and still be useful to detect gross problems. The time to capture the different types of functionality in a site are going to depend on the specifics of the site's workload. For example, an e-commerce site with lots of workload might see almost all of its functionality exercised within a few minutes as it gets lots of load and lots of people buy and search for items on the site. Um, however, a stock, uh, some sort of stock broker website might actually take some, a longer period of time to, to exercise all of its functionality because of, say, uh, modal changes in the application as you go from, say, 5 PM when the stock market closes, and you suddenly start behaving differently in response to purchase requests. Now, there's two different ways that I'm going to talk about uh, building models. And one is a peer comparison model, where we assume that most of the system is working, working right now. Then what we'll do to build our baseline of what's acceptable is to look at, say, all 100 replicated components in a site. And we'll say, what are these 100 components doing right now? And we'll say that the, their average behavior is probably correct. And we'll detect anomalies um, in components that don't match the average behavior. And this will detect problems that affect part of a site. A second complementary model is a time comparison, where we look at a component's behavior over time. Now, this detects bugs that occur um, suddenly. And these are complementary. One of them can't detect problems that affect the whole site, because then your average behavior of the whole site is wrong. But it can detect problems regardless of how long they've been in the system. The second, the time comparison, can't detect problems that have always been in the system, but can affect problems that affect the whole system at once. So now, how do we actually model these behaviors? This is, uh, to model component interactions, what I basically use is a set of weighted links, where each link, each interaction between a component in the system and some other class of components in the system is represented by one arrow going out of the component we're interested in. 
and we're going to weight this link based on the proportion of times that this component's, in, that this component's interaction with the rest of the system goes over that particular link. Now, observing this behavior over, over some period of time or across some period of components is going to give us some idea of what these weights should look like um, uh, under correct normal behavior. And then I'll, we'll, what we'll do then is take that model and compare it to observations of, of individual components um, right now. And an anomaly will indicate a failure. And the specific algorithm we use to, to do this comparison is a chi-squared test of goodness of fit. The way we model path shapes is a little bit more complicated because it's a more complicated structure. It's a tree-based structure that talks about um, how components call each other. What I use here is a probabilist context tree grammar, a structure borrowed from natural language processing. And what this grammar then represents is, given that I'm at a particular component right now, what is the probability of this component calling a particular uh, set of chi child components in this tree? So for example, here I have a two sample paths, one where A calls B calls C, another where A calls B and C excuse me, directly. We can build up our probabilistic context free grammar based on these, paths, these sample paths, and then ask the question, given that I'm at component A right now, what's the probability of me calling B, in this case 50%, versus the probability of calling B and C together, also 50%. Once we've learned this grammar, we'll use it to assign anomaly score to incoming path shapes. Yes? Uh, I was going to say that you're going to catch a lot of really catch errors here, right? Because every time one of the components suddenly goes, goes all the time to the error page, mm -hmm. it's probably going to go a lot more. It's going to be really obvious. Yeah. Right? So, I, I mean, well, yeah. So, to quickly answer your question, I'm not averse to catching easy to detect problems as well. Um, and so what ends up happening is that these techniques uh, detect failures regardless of whether or not, say, an application programmer has programmed the application to gracefully degrade this functionality. So it doesn't matter whether the functionality is changing gracefully or not gracefully, you still detect the problem. That's, so you're right, it does detect those easy to detect problems. Um, so now once I've used this probabilistic context free grammar to assign an anomaly score to every path, we can build up a histogram of these anomaly scores. And so here is a baseline distribution where um, the y-axis here is the number of requests getting a particular anomaly score, and the x-axis here is um, a particular anomaly score. And what you'll see is when there's no problems, this histogram is very left-weighted. So you see almost all the requests are actually getting zero scores, and it goes way off the top of the y-axis. On the right graph here, I inject a fault into the system. And you see that all the failed requests end up getting much higher anomaly scores. And so what you, what you can see is that the tail of the distribution is changing when you start to see um, a faulty requests. And you can use this change in the tail of the distribution to raise an alarm and mark some of these requests as failures. Now on to the second challenge of how do we deal with false alarms. Um, so it's hopefully obvious that there's lots of types of things that can cause changes in assistance behavior that aren't actually failures. For example, different types of requests, obviously, a search request or a check my email request, are going to cause your system to behave in different ways in response to these requests. Now, if you have a large change in your, in your workload mix, where suddenly a lot more people are doing one type of request versus another request, that could cause a gross change in the behavior of your site in a way that's going to cause a false alarm. We'd like to avoid these kinds of false alarms. So the solution I take is to realize that binning, that because I am already tracing a request end to end through the system, I can bin both the component behavior and the path shape behavior by the type of request that cause a particular interaction. So what this means is we can factor out workload variation effects by saying we're going to build separate models for a component or request behavior in the context of search requests and a separate model for the, these behaviors in the context of check my email requests. So if you get a, this sudden shift in, in workload because, say, it's morning now instead of evening, 
those types of effects on the behavior of your site are factored out and don't cause anomalies. Now, having said this, saying that we factor out these false alarms, there are going to be other false alarms that we just can't avoid. For example, statistical techniques can make mistakes. And I say mistakes in quotes because they're really doing the best job they, they can under circumstances where we have limited knowledge. Secondly, there are times when the, when the system's behavior is going to change significantly and appear anomalous, major software upgrades or some hardware changes. But the thing to note is that false alarms are really only bad if the response you're taking to them is costly or unsafe. So what I do in the case of statistical false alarms is combine my techniques with the fast safe response, and that's micro-rebooting, which is work done by George Candé and my office mate. And what this lets us do is very quickly and safely respond to a failure by trying to fix it in a generic fashion. And we've demonstrated this fast end-to-end -end recovery in both the context of J2EE, one of these internet services, and two clustered hash table prototypes. Were you contrasting statistical false alarms with false alarms, statistical false alarms? Mm. The second kind is then where there actually is um, a significant change in the system's behavior because someone upgraded the software. So there, you really do have an anomaly. And so the algorithms are actually right in saying that, that the, these behaviors have changed. So it's not really a statistical problem. So, <coughs> Not so much. They're basically, the way you distinguish between them ends up becoming more of a management process. So for example, for the significant system changes, what you need to do there is retrain your model because the system really has changed and that's OK. And in these circumstances, a human has to either, as they're changing the system, say, I'm expecting the behavior to change and push a big red button, or a version control system can do this automatically, or it has to propagate up, say, after you've tried to do some generic recovery a couple times, the problem has pers persisted, and it looks to be significant enough that you actually want the person to take a look at it. So what's going to happen is you're going to do the micro-rebooting all of the time, and then when there is a significant system change, the system will automatically micro-reboot it like crazy until somebody remembers to retrain it, and then it will stop. Well, there's a second layer question, which is how do you then uh, um, tie this, this uh, fault detection together with recovery? And I, w I would actually suggest that you try to micro-reboot a couple times, maybe. But then at some point, to say, OK, this obviously isn't working. It's either not really a failure, or micro-rebooting isn't the solution. So that's the summary of how I use statistical monitoring of these structural behaviors to detect failures. Now let's go into the evaluation. Um, so, the first thing I did um, to test these ideas was to build pinpoint, a, prototy a prototype of, of, this, of these ideas. And I'll use the word pinpoint throughout the next few slides to describe this prototype. Um, so, in, I had two sets of experiments that I ran. One is in the context of a controlled testbed environment at Stanford. And the second set is, is the um, the real-world validation uh, at these large internet service companies. I'm going to talk about the controlled testbed first. What I did here was instrument J2EE, uh, J2EE middleware, and J2EE, if, if you're not familiar, is a uh, standard espoused by, by Sun for uh, build, helping to build large in, uh, and medium-scale internet services. Um, I looked at one particular implementation of, J2, of the J2EE specification, JBoss, this is an open source system. It has millions of downloads and has actually been deployed in Fortune 500 companies. The idea, the idea that I want to get across here is that this is actually real code that is production worthy code. It's not just a toy system. What I, the changes I made to the system were um, changes to track requests as they flowed across EJBs and JSPs, which are the application level and presentation layer components in the system. I also changed the HTTP server to mark when requests enter the, the, the service in the first place. And then uh, modified the RMI protocols, the JDBC protocols, and JNDI protocols to, to um, track requests as they went across machines, as they hit the database, and as they hit the naming servers. There is a performance hit to the monitoring in my prototype system. That's a 17% throughput decrease. So one thing you can say is you can argue that this throughput decrease is actually um, worth taking to get the extra reliability. But in addition, I'd like to point out 
that there are commercial online implementations of the type of instrumentation that I need that are running online in real systems. Priceline.com, for example, put out a press release a couple years ago saying that they have this instrumentation running and it's helped them with their people debugging their systems. Um, and so my belief is that, is that if you actually put real engineering um, effort into optimizing uh, this instrumentation, which I have not, uh, you can get this performance to the point uh, where it's uh, feasible to deploy it online. On top of this middleware framework that I've instrumented, I've deployed a couple different applications. Uh, one is a pet store e-commerce site. And I've actually deployed two versions of the pet store, pet store 1.1 and pet store 1.3. Um, because they are, and, and I count them as two applications because they are architecturally different enough from each other that um, they look very different internally. Um, secondly is a Rubis, which is an eBay-like auction application developed by Rice University. And uh, finally, I've also done experiments with ECPerf, which is a benchmarking application for J2EE. The workload for the pet store is based roughly on the TPCW workload mix of trying to mix, have a good mix of browse requests versus actual purchase and database heavy requests. And Rubis comes with its own workflow generator, as does ECPerf. Now, the goal of my experiments is to, is to detect uh, changes in, in the application <coughs> behavior under uh, failure conditions. And so what I want to do is actually test how the application responds to failures under a range of scenarios. So the first type of um, failures that I inject are um, declared exceptions and undeclared exceptions, where a declared exception is something that is written out in the method signature of um, of the code. And it's hopefully something that the, the programmer is dealing with because it's in their face and they know that it exists. So hopefully they, they have some graceful degradation in that scenario. Undeclared exceptions are things like null pointer exceptions, out of memory problems, things that the programmer may or may not actually be dealing with gracefully because they might not be anticipating it at a particular point in the code. The next type of fault that I inject is kind of pushing this a bit to the extreme and saying, well, let's take a look at omission call, calls. How will the application behave if we just take a function call and intercept it and don't let it go through, just return right away? We've also looked at other types of failures, source code bugs, um, such as off by one errors, um, and also data corruption problems in the naming server, overload when you throw too much data, uh, too many requests at a system, etc. One thing that I, that I haven't done is uh, run a range of experiments with bit flips and other low-level hardware errors. So people in our group have started to run these experiments. And what they found is in the context of uh, these Java virtual machines that, that we run, that these, that these low-level errors tend to be coerced to appear as, say, I.O. exceptions when the disk starts to go bad. Or they, 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 they tend to cause the JVM to crash, say, if you have bit flips. The final part of my fault injection uh, uh, experiments here are to actually verify that the failures I inject are manifesting as problems in the, in the application server. So what I do here is I canonicalize and check some all the HTML output coming out of the system and compare it to previous runs that I've hand checked and gone over um, and that appear to be correct. Okay, so the first the experiment I'm going to talk to you about is fault detection. What I'm going to do is inject a failure into the system and see if Pinpoint detects the problem. So what I'll do is first capture a baseline of normal, uh, the normal run of the system by sending five minutes of load, about 1,000 requests, and watch how the, comp how the system behaves internally. Then I'll run the same experiment again and capture another five minutes observation, but this time injecting a fault into one of the components. And then I'll compare these two um, sets of observations, and if there's a significant difference in anomaly, I'll raise a flag and say this fault was detected correctly. And I'll repeat this across the different fault types and components in both pet store 1.1 and 1.3. The comparison point that I'm going to use is HTTP and HTML monitors, really simple application generic monitors, where the HTTP monitor looks for HTTP error status problems, such as the server returning HTTP 500 error. Um, and the HTML monitor looks for signs of obvious problems in the returned HTML. For example, errors or exceptions being printed out in the HTML document. I've also run other point experiments with a range of configurations from clustered setups and other applications, different types of failures that I've talked about already, um, and other monitors that I've compared the system against, such as log monitors and exception monitors, 
The reason I don't talk about the results of log and exception monitors here is because I found their false positive rate to be really high. Both of these monitors detected um, failures even when the system was running normally. The exception monitor, for example, that I built looked at, looked at when exceptions were being thrown inside the JVM during a normal run. And it, in, in what I found was that even during five minutes of normal workload, tens of thousands of exceptions were thrown under you know, normal. Uh, that, and these exceptions were not actually indications of failure. And finally, I've also done other experiments testing for false positives, where I put down extreme workload variation or minor software upgrades to test to see how far the system goes before we, we um, have a false alarm. So these are the results that I have on this, shown, on, shown on this graph. This shows the miss rate for the various types of monitors. So the y-axis here shows how many failures were not detected by each of these monitors, and lower is better. Then across the x-axis, we see the different, um, the different miss rates for different types of uh, fail, different categorizations of failures across the different monitors. And you see here that the path shape monitor and the component interaction monitor both did significantly better than the HTTP and HTML uh, monitors. Um, and one note is actually that even though the path shape monitor t seems to do much better than the component interaction monitor, we see the effects of them looking at orthogonal slices of the system, and that the component interaction monitor actually does detect some problems that the path shape monitor does not. So when we combine these, these tests together, it's having one set of results for pinpoint and another set of results for HTTP and HTML errors, we see that pinpoints monitors together actually reduce the overall miss rate anywhere from 30 to 70 percent based on the particular type of fault that's injected. In addition, Pinpo the pinpoint monitors are strictly better. So if you look at the individual experiments, you'll find that there is no experiment in which one of the other monitors detected a problem that pinpoint did not. Mm -hmm. So I'm just curious, what are your bounds for these experiments? The confidence bounds? Ah, the confidence bounds for the statistical significance, for example. In the chi-squared test, um, I use, I believe, a 99.5% uh, confidence. Um, and then for the PCFG, unfortunately, um, I had problems uh, applying the prob uh, a strict probability estimate of these paths based on the PCFG grammar because of a bias against long paths. So I had to step away a little bit from statistically grounded techniques and, and do, do something a bit more ad hoc. That's something that I'm not particularly proud of, but it seems to work well enough um, uh, in my experiment. So I can't give you a statistical, statistical confidence for that for those tests. So now, okay, let's let's say how how does this actually work in in, in real world? In the real. So I've I've been lucky enough to be able to to collaborate with Amazon.com and look at logs of their components' behaviors. Now the logs that they're already taking don't strictly correspond to to what I've been calling component interactions, but they're close enough. And if you want to talk about details, we can we can talk about that offline. Um, but basically, you can, you can squint a little bit and say that I'm applying the same component interaction analysis that I did to J2EE to these logs here. What they do, what they've done for me is when they have a serious failure, take the set of logs capping the failure, an hour before the failure occurred to an hour after the failure occurred, and send these logs to me. And then I analyze it and see whether my uh, analysis would have detected the problem as well. They sent me uh, logs from several different failures, from network outage database problems to load balancer excuse me, problems. And in each case, Pinpoint was able to detect these errors. And there were two advantages that, that I, I found using Pinpoint. And one was that I was able to detect a variety of failures without any special rules, either about the, the system. I didn't have to know what Amazon.com looked like or about the particular location of this fault. I didn't have to be monitoring the database specifically, or the load balancer specifically, to detect a problem that occurred when um, the load balancer of the database failed. So there's more experiments that I want to do because of the way they sent me these logs basically when there is a failure. No. So I, I actually, right before visiting here, I went and talked to them. And I'm going to hopefully be getting more logs and running those experiments later. It was a lot of work. I, I um, basically um, started going over there and visiting with them and trying to convince them with my presentations. And because of some of the earlier work, the slides that I just showed you, they were able to 
they basically got enthusiastic about it. And then after some time of navigating my way through the organization and finding the right people, then I was able to start to go over there, visit more regularly, and get my hands on logs of their systems. Mm -hmm. So, um, In addition, in one of these failures, we noticed that Pinpoint actually detected the failure much earlier than their, than their techniques did. In example, one, uh, one failure was detected five to 10 minutes early. This is actually significant because of the failure they were actually able to fix within 20 minutes. So if we could have given them a 10 minute head start, that's quite significant. The way they were detecting these failures themselves, by the way, was through these high level business metrics, looking for order drops um, at their site. A second internet service that I've gone and talked with um, has been able to give me Unfortunately, they only have component interaction. Um, uh, they only have these component behavior logs uh, that they've been able to give me at their front end and then a couple of their back end services. So I'm actually only able to detect the problem at this moment. And one of the other things that I talked about was actually getting more back end logs and asking them to turn on logging at more of these other systems so that I could analyze that and hopefully better localize the problem. So at service number two, I've been able to get my hands on um, non-structural behaviors of a site. So um, quantitative statistics such as response time, CPU usage, um, et cetera. And in these cases, in this case, what I've been able to do is actually detect um, a, a variety of real failures as well, looking at these problems. So for example, problems that is the hard drive being full and that causing um, this machine to behave um, in odd ways, network bandwidth being hogged on a particular rack. Um, and these include, this set of failures actually includes problems that were not detected by their existing performance monitors. Now, the lessons learned here, actually one of the lessons we learned was not all quantitative statistics are equally useful for detecting problems. Some of them can be wildly anomalous and still actually not be an indicator of a, of a, of a uh, problem. Um, but a second lesson that we can actually pull back into the structural behavior analysis is that bimodal behavior in this system was quite common. In this system, for example, what ends up happening is what we noticed was that there was a set of components that were behaving normally, some that were behaving mildly anomalous to quite anomalous, and then some set of 10 to 20 components that were incredibly anomalous. And what it turned out was that these incredibly anomalous ones were not doing any work. But that was okay. Apparently the way they've set up their system, they often deploy 10 to 20 new machines and then these machines sit idle until someone tells the load balancer uh, that these machines exist. And that's going to happen within half an hour, an hour, and it's not something that's worth worrying about. So in that case, this bimodal behavior of either doing some amount of work or doing absolutely nothing at all was something that we had to compensate for in our algorithms. And that is actually something that we can actually go back and um, look to um, notice in our structural behaviors as well, because not having any behaviors is something that they would, they would um, find a problem with as well. Yep, chat. question about the problems that you found. Um, were they mostly resource issues, like you mentioned on this slide, or mm -hmm. were there any that were like code bugs, or lost state, or do you know what that No, I don't at the moment. So in this case, what happened is they've been actually running my code there against their logs. Um, and then where I got this list of problems was actually I went over there one afternoon, sat down with them, we said, what anomalies are in the system right now? And we just started going through the list. The top one was the hard drive was full on the machine. The second one, the underlying problem was that another machine on the same rack was, was hogging bad. And there were more as well, three or four or more. Yes, as long as... For the Amazon one, do you have any examples from there? Because they knew there was a problem. Problem. Yeah, so those, the, the problems at Amazon were generally caused by, I believe, um, well, the load balancer problem was caused by a human configuration error where someone went into the load balancer, made some configuration problem, and then hours later, it actually manifested as an issue. Um, one of the network router problems was just a flaky box, I think, that just got worse and worse and worse. I don't remember if that was an underlying memory, uh, memory usage failure where the router would just you know, start to use up all its memory or exactly what, that, what the underlying root cause was. And I'm not sure what the database outage was, was caused by as a root cause. Mm -hmm. uh, another question here. Yeah. So 
So I, I want to understand. So in the previous Amazon example, they provided a um, component level sort of transaction log, which then you went ahead and said, oh, well, I'll, I'll pretend that my pinpoint system generates this and just use my analysis component. Yeah. And in the second example, they actually deployed some code you gave them, which worked like a pinpoint system. OK. I'm sorry about the confusion. What the second service did was it, they weren't already taking logs of the types of component interactions that, that I could analyze with my structural anal analyses. But they, what they were taking were these quantitative statistics about the, basically the hardware um, uh, hardware resource usage and stuff at various machines. Right. So sort of each machine had some indirect metrics that completely they were not related at all to the actual component transaction that it was running out of system. Yes. Okay, so you used some different analysis techniques? I did. So there's, I've done other work in, in, in the context of cluster hash tables where there's very little structure to analyze. And so working with, with uh, folks in my group who were building these systems, we wanted to detect problems when they, w as they ran these systems. And so I, I have developed uh, basically quite simple, you know, um, standard median deviation technique based things Just for detecting problems. Though, basically, the, the work being summarized on this slide actually was not related directly to the methods you described earlier. No, no. There's the one lesson to take away. The high-level bit that's that's relevant is that um, generally applying um, um, statistical analysis techniques to look for failures actually actually works in in the real world. So now let me wrap up with some of the takeaway. Um, so the main idea is is that actually these coarse-grained structural behaviors actually do reflect application functionality in a way that we can automatically process. And by processing them with these statistical techniques and having a dynamic observation, just seeing a lot of these, um, of these structural behaviors of a system, we can actually make sense of what the system is doing in a way without understanding the system's behavior at a conceptual level. Um, in addition, the assumption that, that most of the system is working correctly actually ends up uh, being a reasonable proxy for um, for estimating what the correct behavior of the system is, or the probably correct behavior. And all these things together allow us to deploy a monitor that is application generic and can detect failures without having knowledge of what the application is, requiring application changes, and without special config to detect specific types of failures. So there is obviously related work. Um, in terms of instrumentation and analysis of internet services, the Magpie project at Microsoft Research has done a lot of work in low level um, instrumentation and tracing of requests to capture performance and workload character characteristics. Project 5 is HP Labs has done a, done a good work in performance discovery and debugging in the context of uh, black box systems. Both of these have focused on, cap on capturing and modeling behavior and not so much on anomaly detection. That's the main differentiator of, of my work. There are other, other people who have applied anomaly detection to, in to infer failures, of course. Um, uh, uh, Dawson Engler's work on the meta compiler infers code invariants to detect um, detect possible deviations to the way code is written um, inside source code. Um, the deduce project at Stanford and the DICON project at the University of Washington look at an individual program running in a specific process and deduce invariants on how this program is supposed to be behaving, say what what values are being returned by functions, etc. And then um, after some training period, then an invariant that is broken in a run of the system is likely to, uh, to be an indicator of a, of a failure or software bug. Plus, there's lots of other applications of anomaly detection in the areas of machine and industrial process, uh, process uh, analyses and stuff. There are other people who are looking at using statistical learning techniques for other parts of the, of the fault management um, process. Ben Liblet and his collaborators at, at UC Berkeley have done some great work on correlating code level observations of a program's behavior to um, a high-level uh, high indicator of whether that, uh, uh, that whole process has crashed or failed or not, to help you find the lines of, source code, uh, lines of a source code where a bug might actually um, uh, exist in the source code. Mike Chen has looked at decision trees to um, localize failures at eBay. Um, and in both of these cases, the main differentiator between my work and their work is that, is that they assume that whether or not a failure has occurred is already known. So in Mike Chen's work, for example, eBay already, eBay, he looks at requests that are already marked as failing because of HTTP requests or timeouts. Um, and then they try and find the cause of the failure inside the system. 
The third bullet on this lab, uh, on this, on this um, slide, is about neck labs, and what they've actually started doing is is great from my point of view. They've taken my code and said, you know, we're not sure uh, probabilistic context free grammars are the way to go for the future. We want to try alternatives such as uh, learned automata and hidden Markov models, and we think those will do better. So they are machine learning researchers who who are going and trying to find better machine learning algorithms to apply to this systems problem. In the future. What I want to do is actually make systems um, easier to manage and more dependable by helping us better understand their behavior. So basically applying machine learning techniques to translate these low-level behaviors into answers to big picture questions that we care about. Um, so two directions that I can go in is looking at statistical management and other problems where machine learning can help us. And in addition, then, starting to apply these techniques to a wider variety of systems, not just internet service specifically, but other complex, large distributed systems. So, thank you very much. If there are any questions? Question? Then? So, I think it's a follow up to your question. One system we're actually looking at these component direction patterns. Another one you would actually Course of brain uh, system uh, attributes, is that correct? Yes. And I guess the obvious question is how do they compare and what other things can you measure? And just, I mean, I've got up my head system calls, you know, yeah. pretty much anything on the system you can mm -hmm. look at it anomaly. What's the most likely to uh, look at? The nice, what I like about structural behaviors is that um, they have a tie in to the application functionality. Um, and then, you, in addition, they have this nice effect that you can factor out these workload effects. That's not necessarily true for, for performance metrics or the quantitative um, statistics such as Q-link and things like that. Um, otherwise, yeah, a lot of failures are actually going to manifest as changes in lots of different types of behaviors. And in addition, there's lots of other structural behaviors that you can think about analyzing as well. Data access pattern is a big one, especially for longer-lived workflow issues, you know, a purchase order is flowing through a system. The warehouse hasn't seen it, but they've seen all the other purchase orders. There must be something wrong here. Um, so yeah, I, I don't think that, that these are the only structural behaviors we, we, we care about. And I think it's also complementary to um, looking at things like performance anomalies and stuff like that. Any other questions? Yeah? Uh, similar to the components you discussed, how does it relate to the operational profile behavior that people have used in That's probably something we should talk about offline. I'm not particularly familiar with, with um, operational profiles and telecom systems, but I'd be interested to learn. So you mentioned that the, mm -hmm. um, the you know, you think there's an advantage to doing with the structural model, which exploits the functionality of the application, but the cost of that is you had to instrument all the middleware, right? Yeah. Now, how is that? I think early on in your talk, you were presenting saying, well, Application designers can instrument their applications, and that's one way that you get access to a better uh, comprehensive understanding of the systems. Um, why is it you're assuming that instrumenting the middleware is somehow uh, a lesser burden? I mean, it would seem to me to be the same developers that would have to go off and instrument their middleware. It depends on, on how standard the middleware is. So, I mean, if you, if you instrument J2E once, then thousands of application developers are going to be able to just, just use it out of the box. Um, and so that's, that's great. Um, the amount of work involved in that, by the way, to build my instrumentation, it took me, the first cut took me about a week. Um, and then, you know, a, a few more days here and there to instrument extra parts of the system as I wanted to, to get a little bit more data out, say, out of the naming server protocol, for example. Um, um, but yeah, there are some places, especially the older internet services, where they've developed their own homegrown middleware. And in those cases, it would be at least the same corporation uh, paying for people to instrument the middleware. The nice thing is that the middleware does tend to change less frequently than the application. And so as you change your application, you don't have to keep adding in extra hooks or be worried about missing uh, functionality. If you instrument your middleware once and you're confident that it works, it's probably not going to change you know, on the order of, of weeks or months, but more like on the order of years. And uh, uh, a question. So with the Amazon, they did some uh, logging to provide you with transactions. Typically, what you see for a component level logging is what you were to earlier, which is just exceptions or errors. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that, I mean, 
so if you have your, your, your uh, structural model, and you just had, instead of having each component, you had actual transaction logs, but instead you just had error and exception logs, which is the sort of thing that, that most services are already collecting, mm -hmm. um, how much of the value do you get based just on that? Then, so one of the reasons I like to look at these structural behaviors is that they, they, they detect changes in functionality whether the application programmer thought about the problem or not. If they thought about the problem, they're going to change functionality one way and degrade gracefully. If they didn't think about the problem, the functionality changes another way and they don't degrade gracefully. But in both cases, the functionality is changing. When you start to look at only these explicit error and exception logs, then you potentially lose the ability to detect problems that the application developer didn't think about. They either didn't throw an exception in the first place, or they didn't catch it and write out the, the error to the log. Right. Your previous comment mentioned that, you know, even in normal operation, you get a lot of these different exceptions and different errors. Mm -hmm. and I think that there might be something looking at the different frequencies, looking at the different distributions, what proportions are happening, different types, you might be able to learn something. That's possible. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't, I guess, um, say that's not, not going to happen. Um, I, yeah, I can't, I can't say how fruitful that would be. I think in the end it would depend on, well, so then, then I think what you'd end up be looking at is, is treating these exceptions as one other type of behavior of the system that happens to be logged. So it's normal, for example, to get an end of, end of file exception when you reach the end of a file. And if the application is expecting that, the file is over, then, then you're, 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 you're fine and the application will continue to run. Um, but if you then say that there's a whole bunch more of these end of files than we expect, then perhaps files have gotten truncated or, or, or something like that. Uh, and then, yeah, you'd end up then, I guess, treating these exceptions and errors, not necessarily as errors in themselves, but as another type of indication of the behavior of the system. Yeah, exactly. And in that case, yeah, I guess under 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 that model, well, then, that the, could the be fruitful. Well, the advantage then is that you're not asking your, either your developer to add additional instrumentation to middleware, mm -hmm. and you're also not asking your operations guy to turn on additional logging. You know, I, I'd be the first to say that I'd love if they want to do that, but my own experience in operations is you ask them, oh, can you turn on additional logging? And they say, oh, no, you know, that's going to beat the performance of the system. We can't possibly do that. Mm -hmm. And so they're more like, on the other hand, we're already giving, we're already logging this, so can you make something happen with this? You know, for, for, uh, That's true. Yeah. It it might, it's yeah. interesting to see you know, how much of the value, I mean, you know, would be able to do 40% of the value or 50% of the value, if mm -hmm. you were limited not to what Amazon logs special for you, but what they take in there over the normal course of logs, mm -hmm. which might just be the exceptions in there. Yeah. I mean, I'll. I'll I mean, ho hopefully where people are going is, especially with these internet services with parallel workloads, is trading off performance for manageability. Um, and, you know, I won't tell you which company, but, but one place, for example, told me that they'd already made a decision to add in um, extra manageability features um, at a performance hit of about 20%, which I was surprised at. I thought they'd take, you know, 5%, maybe, not 20 but they did. Um, so I, I hope that that's the direction we're going in the future, because otherwise this manageability problem is just, is not going to get better. We need visibility. Okay, thank okay. you. Thank you very much.